Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Matthew and today we are going to be talking about wax contouring of your trial denture, which is otherwise called festooning. Now, when we talk about wax up, when we use the word wax up, uh, different people can have different ideas. They can think about a hundred different things. For example, wax up can mean the waxing up of a cast restoration. Wax up can mean a diagnostic wax up so that the patient can see what you are going to do or what is a proposed end result of the treatment going to look like. Also, a wax up can mean that you are doing, let's say, putting up the components of an RPD. It can also mean waxing up of a complete denture. So it can mean a lot of things to different people. So when you look at GPT-1, wax up was defined as the contouring of a wax pattern for a cast restoration, as well as the contouring of the wax base of a trial denture into the desired form. Now, because wax up can refer to so many different things, over the years, the definition has become more differentiated. And by the time we get to GPT-9, it talks about the word festooning. So what is festooning? Festooning is basically the waxing up of the denture base so that the root eminences and other structures are simulated, right? So GPT-9 describes it this way. It says, carvings of the base material of a denture that simulate the contours of the natural tissues that are being replaced by the denture. What is important here is this, that for a long time people thought that only root carvings or root eminences are called festooning. But GPT-9 makes it clear that it is not only the root eminences but also the other associated natural tissue that is being duplicated by the denture that needs to be carved and all of that carving comes under this umbrella or this word called festooning. So festooning is a great word to differentiate between the wax contouring of a complete denture and the wax contouring or wax pattern formation for any other prosthetic work, prosthodontic work, right? So this is the difference between the two. All right, so what are the objectives of festooning? The objectives of festooning is to create a natural and pleasing appearance and to improve the retention and the stability of the tension. What are the requirements that we have? Number one requirement is that it should accurately, as accurately as possible, simulate the natural tissue that it is replacing. So obviously the edges are going to cover some tissues and you want to simulate those same tissues so that when the patient smiles, no one knows there is a denture. Number two, the borders. Now here you have maxillary and mandibular. So the borders in labial and buccal for maxillary and in mandibular, the lingual also. The borders of the de wax cup trial denture need to fill the vestibule. Now, we know that when we record the vestibule, okay, let me presume that this is a mandibular buccal side vestibule. We recorded the vestibule's width and depth or depth and width in function, which is why we made the movements. Now, the movements can be operator generated or patient generated. Either ways, it was done in function so that the patient can speak and function normally and if the denture should be still retentive. So the point was that you should fill this vestibule if you want it to be retentive, just like how retentive it was in the impression. If you change the width or change the depth, you are going to have a less retentive denture. In the trial denture, you are going to ask the patient, you are going to place it in the patient's mouth and you are going to ask the patient to speak. You are going to ask the patient to function in some to some degree. When he does that, if the denture is not retentive, it's going to give you a tough time trying to record, trying to judge if it is okay or not. For this reason, we want to do the wax up to include the width and the depth of the vestibule completely. Now, here, what you need to remember is this. When we make a denture base, there are two types of denture base that you can make. One is a permanent base and one is a temporary base. If you make a permanent base, you're going to, in either of them, you want to fill the whole area. But when you make the permanent base, you fill up the entire vestibule and you, you, you flask it and you process the base and take out the base. If the cast breaks or the land area, part of it breaks, it's fine because you, you have already secured a permanent denture base. But in case you're making a temporary record base, like how most of us do it, at that point, if the denture base, of the, I'm sorry, if the cast breaks, if the land area breaks when you're trying to retrieve the denture base, then we are in trouble. For this reason, for this reason, we always tend to keep the denture base slightly short of the width of the vestibule. We most definitely go all the way to the depth of the vestibule, 
but we tend to keep it slightly short of the width of the vestibule so that we can actually pry out the denture base easily without fracturing the land area and thus losing the width of the vestibule. When you're doing this, it's important that if your denture base is a temporary denture base and you have some space left in the width part of your vestibule, fill it up with wax so that the denture is retentive. Right. That was the second point. Third, the palatal portion of the denture base need to be at least 2.5 millimeters thick. Remember, when you finish it, you're going to be trimming a little bit and polishing the palatal aspect. So when you do that, you will lose about 0.5 millimeters of thickness, polishing, trimming, all that. So for that reason, it is a good idea to keep it 2.5 millimeters. So when you finish it, it comes down to two and a minimum thickness of two should be what will give you enough strength. So remember to do that. All right. The third one, the fourth point is that the contour of the denture flange should accommodate or should be compatible with the drape of the cheek and the tongue in the mandibular. That means it cannot be bulky and bulging outward, but it should be compatible with the drape of the cheek and it should not be bulky and uh, bulging towards the tongue because that will tend to irritate the tongue and the tongue will try to move, pushing it out and making the denture highly in unstable. All right. So the next one is, the, um, I told you about the lingual flange. The last one is the labial portion of the maxi denture needs to be minimally thick. Don't make it too thick unless the patient has lost some of his bone because of trauma, because of uh, any reason. Let's say he had extraction from the anterior first, whatever it is, surgical excision, whatever it is. Unless the patient needs that sort of bulk for lip support, you don't want to make it thick because the thicker you make it, the more protrusive it's going to be and it's not going to be aesthetic. Okay, what are the common errors that people do when they do festooning? Well, number one, the gingival portion. Well, here they tend to over contour the gingival portion so it starts looking inaesthetic and it starts looking like the patient has got gingivitis. So that's something you want to avoid. Inflamed, puffy gingiva, that's something you want to avoid. The second one is the internal papilla, also connected with the gingiva here. Of course, the internal papilla can be non-existent. That's one thing. That means that there's a big black triangle there, space between the teeth and the, where the gum is, which will lead to dark spaces which are not aesthetic. And two, it can lead to food entrapment, which is eventually going to create all other sort of problems. That's one. Second is too large a papilla. Too large a papilla will start looking inflamed, will start hiding the teeth, all sorts of things. So you want to keep a papilla that is looking uh, natural in contour. Now remember with in the thing of the papilla, uh, with regards to the papilla, what you need to remember is that the papillary height will vary with the age and the papillary point, the sharpness of the point also varies with age. So if you have an older patient, you're going to have slightly blunter tips, right? Especially as you go to the posterior. And you have younger patients, you're going to have more sharper tips even as you go to the posterior. So the anterior is usually sharp, but as you get into the canine premolar regions, those are the regions where it starts going to start getting important to contour it more better. You can also make slight tweaks, very mild tweaks in the anterior region, provided the age of the patient justifies such uh, changes in shape. So keep that in mind when you're contouring the internal papilla. All right, what are the things to remember when you do festooning? Number one, you want to remove the cast from the articulator. Okay, you want to remove the cast from the articulator. Some of the time, most of the time, I see students taking the denture from the cast and trying to do it. Now, when you do that, uh, chances of prolonged, you you're using it in your hand for a long period of time, and it's not on the cast, nor the denture base is in the water, and you, you know, if you do that, you're going to warp the denture base, okay? And especially you're using a lot of heat. So, it's a good idea to retain it on the cast. Second, if you can remove the Entire, if you keep the entire cast on the articulator and work, when you're working, you may end up dropping wax and pieces onto the lower denture or the lower cast, and that again creates other problems. So it's a good idea to remove the cast from the articulator and then do it. Now, this assumes one thing. This assumes that you have an articulator which supports metal rings or metal plates that are called mounting plates or mounting rings or some other mechanism where you can remove the cast from the articulator. This is what I'm presuming here. Now, in case you don't have an articulator that supports that, you don't have much of a choice. You probably will have to take out the denture and work with it like that. So the second point is,
to contour the wax carefully and to, so that you can prevent the movement of the teeth. What do I mean by that? I mean that we need to contour it with a gentle hand, not heavy handedly. Sometimes, you know, we get very excited, we start working and we heat up everything and it definitely is going to move the teeth. So be very gentle when you do your wax contour. All right. I see a lot of the time when we are working, uh, the students tend to see the air bubble in the occlusal rim. And now that, you know, they have, they are in that mode of finishing it up and making it look beautiful. They go with a very heated instrument. They go in deep down into the rim and start to uh, remove the air bubbles. Now that is a good idea to do that at the occlusal rim fabrication stage. All right. This is not the time to do that. If you do it now after you've arranged your teeth, chances are that you will end up moving your teeth. So maybe you want to do that at a later time. Uh, I mean, at an earlier time, not now, not, not at this time. If you find some air bubbles there, and if your teachers are keen on that, then be very careful trying to remove that. Remove small sections at a time. If you're going to heat up an entire block of wax, an entire area, melt it out into liquid and then let it harden up. Remember that as wax cools down, it's going to contract. When it contracts, it's going to pull the teeth with it, especially if you've heated up the deeper layers of the wax. For this reason, you want to always limit your wax contouring and your work to the superficial layers. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. All right. The third one is to avoid a bulky wax up. A bulky wax up means you've got a lot of wax on the denture, on your trial denture, and you're going to end up processing that. That one is going to be anesthetic. Two, it's going to increase the weight. Three, it's going to be very bulky and difficult for the patient in the patient's mouth. Four, it's going to create more processing errors, dimensional changes when you finish processing because there's a lot of uh, resin in, in it. So to avoid all of this, keep it slim and trim. Keep it, keep it minimal, okay? Keep it minimal so that you have a very good finish. All right, so this is an example of an articulator that has got mounting plates. This is a mounting table, of course, but you can have a mounting plate at the bottom as well. And this is an uh, example of an articulator that has got mounting plates where you can remove the mounting plate and that will help you remove the cast completely and do the trial. I think most of you are using an articulator similar to this, so definitely you understand what I'm telling you when I say remove the cast and use it. I'm just saying that because there's some places, some articulators, uh, children use that cannot, do not have this functionality. And let me tell you honestly, it is worth the investment. It is worth the investment to get a decent articulator because you're going to be doing three to five to 10 dentures uh, in your undergraduate program and having the ability to work multiple dentures at the same time is really going to be helpful. Having the ability to take out the cast is really going to be helpful. So this is a good option. Think about it and invest in a good articulator, whichever brand it is and Make sure that it has these features so it is good, sturdy, and you can work with it. Right. So, what is the procedure for festival? The first most important procedure is to add a layer of wax from the gingival third to the border, to the vestibule, okay, to the border area of the denture. A strip of wax you're going to adapt. Flame it lightly and adapt it onto the wax. When you when you flame it, you want to flame it enough so that you don't trap any air bubbles. You want to just flame and adapt all across. Once it's adapted, like you see there, and it's cooled down, then you can seal it, okay? So you can add some on the palatal surface also, again from the gingival third of the teeth down, you can add on the palatal surface as well. Make sure that you have enough thickness of 2.5 millimeter at least, okay? Especially in thin areas. One of the ways you can use it is to pick up the denture base and look at it in, in, in the light and you can see if any area is thin. If those areas are thin, you want to measure those areas, okay? Good idea that I would do is to mark it with a pencil on the tissue fitting surface, not on the polished surface, so that I can see the outline. Then I add wax in that area. I check how thick it is using a caliper, and then I add wax in that area till I reach about two to 2.5 millimeters, at least 2.5 millimeters thickness. Once I reach there, then I just flame it and finish it up, all right? So that's what I do. Once you've done that, once you've done and adapted your wax to the palatal portion, like I told you before, right, this is what you want. Especially if there's a prominent mid palate and raphid, this area will be too thin and this will be too thick. So try to look, judge. After a couple of times using a caliper, you have a fair idea how much 2.5 feels like. And then you can just go with your judgment. That, that should be fine. Okay. 
Right, so once you've done that, once the wax is cooled, you want to seal down the wax in the interdental papilla just to resemble a natural papillary shape. You're going to do the carvings later on, but just to get a natural papillary shape or a height, you can do it with a heated instrument. And once you've sealed it in properly, then you go on further. So at this point, you want to ensure that there is no material standing across the bulk of your denture. I told you before that you want to increase the wax to the vestibule width, the entire width. If you are doing that, if you are having it either in a permanent denture base or you are having it built up with wax, you don't want any wax to extend beyond that. So that line that forms between the junction of the vestibular buccal surface and the land area and in the case of lingual, the lingual surface and the land area, that line should be the judge of the limit of your wax up. Any wax beyond that, you want to trim it away and make sure that nothing is crossing that border because that's going to destabilize the denture, right? So you don't want too much wax there because it becomes too thick and destabilized. If it's too thin, there won't be proper seal when the patient's trying to speak. All right, so now you take out the uh, instrument, the sharp instrument, keep it at about 45 degrees to the neck of the teeth and you can start to carve out the wax or remove the wax that is screwed onto the surface of the teeth. Here you want to expose the entire tooth. You really don't want to expose the neck unless you are doing some capitalization. So you really want to just expose the tooth, the clinical crown of the, of the artificial teeth. And then this is the place at which you want to make your papillas look nice. So you want to make them sharp, you want to make them slightly blunted, you want to contour the different heights. There's a chart that shows the different interdental papillary heights between central, lateral, canine. So you can follow all those things at this stage. Once this is done, you're going to move forward. You're going to go to the lingual flange. The lingual flange in the denture that we mentioned here is important, okay, because of the contour of the tongue. So the contour of the tongue needs to be taken into account. So you don't want to have it bulky. You want to have it slightly concave from the neck of the teeth to the base of the vestibule, slight concavity, which gives space for the tongue. This is very important. I'll show you some pictures here. This is too much. You can see that the vestibule is not having an adequate emergence profile. The vestibule is there and it's backing out. That's not good. This is what I would suggest, something that goes in line with the vestibule. And that is over contoured where it is going beyond the vestibule and jumping, bulking out of the vestibular limit. So you want to stick to something like this with a slight concave uh, feel in the lingual side that can accommodate the tongue. Right. Proper contouring of the wax for the cheek and the tongue really will help stabilize the denture. Okay. Once the child denture borders are correctly contoured, it is best to seal the denture onto the cast using minimal wax. Mm -hmm. So once you've done this basic contouring, basic shape, it's better to seal it onto the cast because unless you do that, you are going to come to a place where a lot of wax is going to flow across onto the border. I want you to stop there and seal it so that any wax that's flowing is going to flow off the border onto the cast and you can separate it easily, right? And besides, it needs to be very stable on the cast while doing the rest of the procedures. Right, so now when you've done your wax up, you've sealed your denture with very little wax. Let me emphasize that don't put a lot of wax because you want to take it out for a trial. So with the very little wax, you're going to seal the denture, the trial denture onto the cast. Once it's done, you want to remove any excesses on the land area. You want to remove any excesses that have disturbed that concave contour on your trial denture. So you just remove those areas and make it, bring it back to that natural contour. And then you start your carving, right? So when you start, when you do that, you're going to get something like this. When you remove that excess and just brought that concave shape back again, you're going to get something like this. And obviously you can see that place where the fresh wax was added looks bulky. It looks like gingivitis. So this is the area that you're going to cut down. You're going to cut back on. You're going to trim on, on it. And so that this bulk starts to really come down and starts to look natural. So you're going to start off with uh, working in between these, in between this internal papilla area, between the roots on the internal papilla area, just keeping yourself a little above it and starting to remove the wax from there and cleaning and 
recarving and cleaning and recarving till you start getting those depressions and those eminences that are clear for you to appreciate. Okay, now when you're doing the final finishing, I see a lot of people using this sort of a plate torch, blow torch. It's absolutely fine to use it. You can use it very efficiently in many, many places, but not for final finishing. Reason? See, this thing heats up to 1300 degrees Celsius and wax gently melts around 120 to 150 degrees Celsius, depending on what brand you're using. So if you're going to use something this hot and you're going to flame it, what's going to happen is that all your carving is just going to melt. And if that melts, well, all your work is gone. It's just going to melt onto your tooth and just flow everywhere. So you don't want that to happen. You want to keep your temperature low. And even then, when you use an alcohol torch, even that is 5 degrees Celsius. So definitely you don't want to bump and blow it that way at a spot if you finish carving. That's not a good idea. You want to make gentle passes. Mm -hmm. So you heat it and you make a pass. You make a pass. Just let the wax heat up a little and cool down, giving you that glossy appearance. Right? So if you use excessive heat, you're going to get scorched teeth around the margins. And this is going to show when you have processed the denture. Trust me, it's not going to show when you're waxing because the wax will enter it and you won't see it. But when you finish processing, the neck of your teeth will have this whitish appearance and you know you've burnt it. The same thing happens when you use a chip blower. So when you use a chip blower over a Bunsen flame also, remember the Bunsen flame is very, very hot. So keep your blower at a distance, keep your cast at a distance, I'm sorry. Keep your cast at a distance, blow and make passes, make passes. Don't keep it heated onto one surface because it's going to burn. All right, so this is an alcohol torch and this is a typical thing that we see. But if you make passes, you will be fine. Uh, the wax will just warm up and, you know, become glossy. And at that point, you can take some wet cotton. Don't use dry cotton because it will make it look matte finish and it might stick to the uh, wax if it's a bit too hot. So to stay safe, use a wet cotton and don't squeeze your cotton. Okay, keep it loose, keep the cotton loose, just dip so it's not squeezed. Don't squeeze out the water, just take it, just hold it in your hands for a few seconds, the water drip, and then you can use that wet cotton in that state with lots and lots of water to just cool down the surface. Again, remember, all the wax carving and festooning that you're doing is done primarily on that first layer of wax that you added. You are not going deeper into it. The more deeper you go, the more chances of all this heating and cooling is going to shift your teeth. Okay, so the wax in which the teeth are set need to remain at the same temperature. It's only the outer layer that you're really working at. Even when you do that, the wax inside is going to get heated up a little bit. But you don't want to heat it up too much because it's going to move there. All right. We have something else called stippling, orange peel appearance. Everybody uh, talks about this. It's a very interesting uh, thing to have, especially if you are really looking at characterizing your denture. Now, if you want to get this orange peel appearance, you want to use a stiff brush. So if you're using a toothbrush, you want to select something that is hard. Don't you take a medium or soft toothbrush. And you want to press the toothbrush onto the surface of the denture with a steady, firm motion and take it off. You want to press and push, press and pull, because that's going to create lines, not stippling. Okay? So that's very important. And you do this only on the facial surface, usually around the gingival areas, right? You're not going towards the border of the denture, just around the gingival areas near the neck of the teeth. So, like we told you before, when you want to, when you plan to do stippling, what you want to do is you want to use your flame and just flame the denture lightly, use a stiff brush, go in with moderate steady pressure, go in and come out. Don't move your brush, move your brush to create lines. So just go in and come out, go in and come out in different areas. And you can do that reasonably fast, not just too fast, but you can do it reasonably fast and it should look absolutely fine. Let it cool down before you uh, brush it with a completely clean brush. Okay, let it cool down. You can cool it down naturally or you can cool it down to even water, but let it cool down before you try to clean it. Because sometimes when you do the stippling, you find a lot of small, small pieces of wax and you're tempted to clean it immediately. If you try to do that, you end up probably messing up what you just did. So, if you're doing stippling, be gentle, 
plane gently, use a firm brush, moderate steady pressure in and out, in and out. Wait for it to cool down and then you can clean up anything that you need to clean up and nicely polish it up, anything else that needs to be. Again, don't heat up too much when you're polishing after this because then the stippling will close. Very gentle and polish it up and leave it like that. All right. So that brings us to the end of our, den, uh, of our uh, lecture today. Short lecture. But I wanted to just notice this. This is a record base made in transparent material. And see the amount of wax that's been added. Minimal wax has been added. This is what I said. Keep it lean. Keep it slim. Keep it lean and thin. Don't, don't over bulk it. So that it's very uh, comfortable to the patient. As well as you minimize the amount of processing errors. Thank you so much. Have a great day.